And, okay. uh, yeah, it's my uh, really uh, great pleasure uh, to uh, uh, have our keynote speaker, the Wednesday keynote speaker, uh, David Patterson here today. Uh, I, I think uh, Dave uh, needs no real introduction because to most of us, he's known from uh, the very beginning of uh, our studies. Yes, when you look at his textbooks uh, and uh, then you already uh, always know uh, the name. Uh, he is uh, known for his research projects on risk and rate uh, and uh, he got many awards. I cannot mention them all. Yeah, so he's an IEEE fellow. He uh, uh, is an ACM fellow. He was also the president of, of the ACM. And uh, he also received together with uh, his colleague, uh, John Hennessy, uh, the ACM uh, AM Turing Award. Yeah, so. And I, I could continue for uh, for a long time, but this would take too much of your time. And we are, of course, far more interested to hear what you have to say. And when we uh, thought uh, about risk five, yes, what is a very hot topic in our domain? Yes, we thought there cannot be a better speaker than you about this. Yes, because you uh, started the, the the whole risk, yeah, and you are still very active in the risk five uh, activities. So, uh, Dave, we are very happy that you agreed to join us here today, and I hand over to you. Thanks a lot for being here, and uh, so please start with your presentation. All right. Thanks, Rolf, uh, very much, and thanks for inviting me. Uh, we were just talking about uh, what's going to be the long-term impact of COVID, and I think uh, virtual meetings uh, might be part of it. I'm actually giving, <clears throat> I'm giving two talks this morning. <laughs> one in California and one in Germany, back to back, and I don't think there would be another way to do that. <laughs> uh, so the, what I'm going to talk about is, is risk five, uh, and here's the outline I'm going to cover. Well, you know, who cares about instruction sets? Let me motivate that. Uh, I'm going to give you the history, how this came about, uh, talk about the foundation that's responsible for it, risk five international, how it, risk five is spread around the world, um, kind of why it's so popular, and then talk, get into kind of instruction set details about some of its key differentiating features of simplicity, stability, and extensibility. Uh, one of the new extensions is vector uh, architecture, which I'm a big fan of. And so I'm gonna kind of go into a little bit more depth, give you some insights about why I like vector a lot more than the SIMD and why the RISC-V vector is a particularly elegant version of it. And then another area that's really exciting is because of the openness of RISC-V is the, uh, the fact that we could actually make some progress on security, which is, you know, the fact that there are people making millions of dollars ransoming, using ransomware on innocent businesses is one of the embarrassing things of our technology. It'd be great to make some. And then at the end, I'm going to show you a little video that um, that celebrated the 10th anniversary that kind of conveys the enthusiasm about risk five. Okay, so whoops, <laughs> started. So why instruction set matters? Uh, so first, why can't Intel x86 architectures, why, why aren't they in mobile chips? Why, that's a huge market. Intel would love to be in that market, why not? It's because uh, virtually 100% of those phones use the ARM instruction set architecture, not Intel. And so why have uh, ARM partners so far had minor impact on servers? Same thing. Now, almost 100% of the servers are based on the 64-bit Intel instruction set, that uh, x86 instruction that the AMD actually uh, done. So Intel builds both of them. And, there are, and that goes into servers. And IBM, which you know is no longer the computer powerhouse, it still sells ten billion dollars a year of mainframes. Why is that? It's still this IBM 360 instruction set, the oldest surviving instruction set. It's uh, I think it's 57 years old, and and it shows no signs of stopping. So, the instruction set architecture is actually the it matters. It's the most important interface in the computer because it's where hardware, it's how hardware talks to software, right? So when software speaks to hardware, it has a vocabulary and the name of that vocabulary is an instruction set and uh, 
the words of that vocabulary instruction. So it's really an important interface. Now, one of the interesting things about up until recently, uh, instruction sets have always been proprietary. A company owns one. Well, what people don't realize is if it's a, in capitalism, companies can come and go, or you can sell instruction sets. So there was this company in, in the last century that was a great engineering company, Digital Equipment Corporation. And when it had three really popular instruction sets, and when it went out of business, so did those instruction sets. Uh, Intel is still around. It's making a lot of money selling the x86 instruction set, but it's killed off a few instruction sets. Uh, people may not remember the i960 and the i860, but the Itanium was, you know, very heavily invested in in this century, but uh, didn't make it, and it has died off. Spark, that was the one that I was involved in, was a risk arch early risk architecture that Sun did in 1990, and was actually even an IEEE standard. After Sun went out of business, Oracle bought it and kept it going for many years, but I think it uh, it closed it down in 2017. MIPS. A really nice architecture by my colleague uh, John Hennessy. I, I bought the same from the 1980s. It was been sold to several companies, um, and right now, uh, they, for a while, they made it an open architecture, and then they changed their mind and closed it again. And so, I'm a little unclear right now who owns MIPS today. IBM Power. It was. It's been around since the about the 1990s. And they recently decided to make it open yeah, as open power. And ARM, which was uh, by the company uh, that, that owned it for many years, but was purchased by SoftBank five years ago. And then NVIDIA last year is in the process of acquiring it again. So they can disappear or they can be sold to companies and, and it's possible they could be sold to your competitor. So that's something you know companies can worry about. So why doesn't this happen for software? Why doesn't, you know, why isn't somebody buying your software and then you have to buy it from your competitor? Well, uh, the software came up with the idea of open standards and uh, it's in networking, operating systems, compilers, and so forth. You have these open standards, that's kind of the interface. And then you can have open implementations of those standards. Since the standard is open, many people can build it. So there's lots of compilers and operating systems and databases and, and so forth. But you know, there's a, both open open source implementations and there's proprietary implementations. So that if you want to have something fully supported or a company's delivering, so you can do it either way, either having a proprietary or free and open standard. But the key to having both options is having the standard. So why don't we have this? If the if we've done this for all these other interfaces, why haven't we done it for the most important interface? In the computer, why haven't we done it for instruction sets? So that's kind of the motivating question. And there's a lot of instruction sets today. It's not like they're going away. If we talk about this as a uh, system on a chip from NVIDIA, and there's a ton of different processors on that chip, and each of them often has its own instruction set. You know, the one we think about is the application processor that you can download software on, and that's almost always ARM, but there's graphics, image, radio signal processing, audio, security processors, party management. There could be dozens of instruction set architectures in an SOC, each with its own unique software stack. And why? <laughs> well, because typically the instruction sets for the application processor are too big and, they, and there's maybe restrictions, so you can't make customization that you need for the accelerators. Um, you get the intellectual property from different companies, uh, and companies often will make those instruction sets uh, proprietary. And then sometimes engineers, when they're doing uh, one, of the, one of the pieces themselves, well, they don't feel like buying. It's not that difficult a processor, so they'll just make their own. And so th th these are all reasons that you get lots of different instruction sets on SSC. And that's kind of the way things are today. Do we need all these instruction sets? Uh, 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 do they have to be proprietary? Uh, and, you know, it, should we let them keep using instruction sets that can go away? And, you know, why not? Suppose there was a stable, free and open instruction set that everyone used could everything. It, I think technically it's possible. Well, why not do it? Okay, so this leads to risk five, and I'll explain that. So just about a decade ago, uh, we were starting a new uh, 
research project called the PAR lab, Parallel Computing Lab, with the popularity of open cores. And we wanted to do architecture work. We could see that Moore's law was starting, you know, going to start slowing down. And we wanted to do research in the area of accelerators um, to go along with that. So we were going to need an instruction set. And Krista Sanovich and I had done a variety of projects in the past where we'd use standard instruction sets and tried to leverage it. So that, you know, we give MIPS and Spark in X86. Uh, in 2010, the obvious choice, there's only two choices, you know, uh, in terms of impact, that was X86 ARM. And even though Intel was one of our sponsors, uh, there was a couple of strikes against X86. It was just too complicated. And so, and, we weren't allowed to use it. Intel did not want us making implementations of x86. There's restrictions on that. The other one is ARM. And even ARM is a very rich instruction set. It'd be a big lift to be able to build a full ARM architecture there. It also didn't have a 64-bit address space thing at the time. And again, there are IP restrictions. There was a while that ARM wouldn't even let you build a simulator of the ARM instruction set and put it on, on the web. So we kind of not that they were all that attractive, but we actually couldn't use them. Oops. So uh, at the beginning of this, the PAR lab, uh, Krista Sanovich and a couple of grad students decided, hey, let's just do a quick three month project. We'll, we'll do our own instruction set and that's, we'll use that for our research. And what the idea being, you know, we'd make it open because we think it'd be good to have a new instruction set, a nice clean instruction set that we could use for our research and for our teaching. But other universities could use it too. And so, well, uh, and as Krista Sanovich, uh, my colleague, uh, led the effort as a faculty member, and, but two really great grad students, Andrew Waterman, whose actually dissertation was about uh, RISC-V, and Yunsef Lee, who did a lot of the implementations around RISC-V. And then I provided senior wisdom for the projects. So it took four years. It didn't take three months uh, because they took it very seriously and did a really good job on it before the music frozen, but you know, along the way they built many chips. So it, we, it had kind of the luxury of having the instruction set be flexible, why you could build several of them and see what was hard and easy and build the software stack and what worked and what didn't. So it could be flexible for a while, but after four years, he said, okay, uh, that's good enough. We can freeze that and use that forever. So it's called RISC V because it's the fifth major project at Berkeley. I, I led four of them in the 1980s, and you know, uh, to kind of honor those projects, they decided to call it uh, RISC V. Okay, so that's what was going on. And interestingly, uh, we were very enthusiastic about it. It was really fun for us, and it was helpful for our research and for our teaching. But uh, other academics weren't particularly interested in it. They kept using, trying to do commercial instruction sets or they use their own. They weren't all that excited about the idea. So things changed in 2014 when we started getting a request from outsiders asking us about why were we changing our instruction set, our, you know, the Berkeley RISC-V instruction set in our classes. Why'd you make that change? And like, well, why, why do you care? <laughs> it's, it's something that we're using locally. And then what we discovered in talking to them is there is, you know, kind of this question that I said earlier, why can't we have an open instruction set? Well, people were looking for that. They stumbled around RISC five and they really liked it. They said, wow, this would be a really great, it's a fresh, clean start. This could be a really good uh, instruction set that we could use as open. So you already had it open and I'd like to implement it. So once we kind of understood that there was a demand for it, then we decided what we would do is that's a great, wow, an open instruction set that everybody used. That sounds like great, let's make it happen. And so I'm actually wearing uh, one of the shirts from that era, uh, but, and we made our own logo. So at the hot chip conferences in Silicon Valley uh, in uh, August of 2014, we decided we're gonna try and promote it. So we're, we're wearing a little badge that says, uh, ask us about RISC-5 or there's another badge that said, instruction sets wanna be free. And we had posters and stuff like that. So this is a book to the Berkeley graduate students here. Uh, Yunsup Lee, uh, Chris is the, the tall guy in the back. He's, I think he's six, six. And then uh, Yunsup Lee and Andrew are in the middle and the, I'm the bald guy over there on the, on the end. Uh, but we started to try, we tried to play it up as, hey, you should be interested in production sets. Uh, we realized based on the feedback uh, 
Well, first of all, one of the things we learned is, well, I think we knew some of this, but in looking back historically, this was not the first attempt to do an open instruction set. It kind of, once a decade, people give it a try. And uh, basically this one has finally had liftoff. So I had the rocket on the first slide. So there was something uh, in the United States, uh, there's a military standard. It was actually an instruction set developed by the Air Force. I guess they thought they would have an instruction set that they liked and then other people would build it for them. So this was 1980, and it lasted basically about 15 years before they shut it down. The spark that I was involved in uh, was about 1990. Uh, the management had this idea to make it a open standard that anybody could use, and their idea was they'd create a little uh, ecosystem around Spark, and there'd be all these companies we'd share the software and stuff like that. It was an interesting business strategy, and and, and Sun actually got some benefits uh, from that. Uh, but it was only 32 bits and when as i said oracle shut this all down in 2017 so it didn't it had minor success but didn't really take off uh there was an, an open risk uh effort about they wanted to have an open 32-bit processor implementation so they actually took uh, hennessy and i when we did our textbook that ralph mentioned we didn't want to pick anyone's uh, instruction sets, so we made up our own for the textbook. It was called DLX. We pronounced it Deluxe. It was just kind of a synthesis of a bunch of risk architectures so that we didn't have to pick one. You know, I was with Spark. He was with MIPS. There were all these others out there. So that was in our book. And so the per people asked, I remember getting the email, would it be okay if we built hardware based on the Deluxe instruction set? And I said, sure, that'd be great. Uh, but uh, they actually kind of, didn't, they weren't trying to set an instruction set standard as much as uh, they just wanted to have an open processor that they could build. So that kind of didn't, uh, it didn't really take off. It was kind of languishing in 2010. They didn't have a 64-bit address one yet. And so RISC V, so the idea has been around, RISC V has taken off. There's already billions of cores shipped. You know, now it's seven years after, you know, 11 years after it was invented, seven years after we tried to make it. Uh, a, a standard, and as you'll see, the now billions, of course. So I think we've achieved liftoff, and I think we're in orbit and are are, are going toward Mars or wherever our target is here. So one of the things we realized in talking to people about this is, you know, as long as it's just a UC Berkeley project, people companies aren't getting behind it because faculty can leave or faculty can change their minds what they want to work on. So we needed to create a foundation. To handle it, you know, we looked at, we tried to learn from the open source project. So Linux Foundation existed. It, it takes care of care and feeding of Linux. So we wanted to do the same thing for RISC V. So we created a foundation in 2015. It was recently renamed to be RISC V International, kind of emphasize it's a worldwide standard. So it's a nonprofit uh, serving its members in the whole industry. It kind of owns the RISC V instruction set. It starts off with that frozen base that we did at Berkeley in 2014, and then it involves a very large number of people to evolve it over time for the things that are missing. And uh, let me point out, right, I forgot to say at the beginning, but the CEO of RISC-V International is Calista Redman, and I'm using some of her slides in this, and then I'm using Krista Sonovich's slides for, for a lot of this uh, as I'm going through. So the RISC-V ecosystem is the Inter RISC-V International controls the spec. It has a golden model and does uh, compliances. And then the community does the rest of it. There is software and hardware. The hardware, like I said, when you have an open spec, you can have open source cores. Uh, there's a lot of them from academia. I In italics, I mentioned Swerve and the Zwanti. Swerve comes from Western Digital. So it's a commercial implementation that they've made open source. And Zwanti comes from Alibaba. It's a very aggressive open source out of order execution that they just like a week or so made open source. A uh, lot of commercial providers uh, and certainly kind of almost by definition that the other instruction sets have restrictions on who can impl implement it. There's certainly more companies, more organizations building RISC-V processors than any other instruction set in the world. Uh, you know, uh, there's a bunch of universities as well as these companies uh, on the right. And then there are people who are building it besides just for internal use. So uh, Western Digital and Alibaba, I mentioned, they've made their open source. NVIDIA ships them in every single GPU they made. They use it. They use their own implementation. And they haven't made that open source. So here's all these options. 
okay, where are we going to get the software? So, well, the good news is uh, everybody uses open source software. So if, if, if the foundation had developed unique software, well, this would never fly, but that's not the world we live in, uh, open source software standards. So pretty much all the standard open source software is available on RISC-5, you know, today, which is, you know, 11 years after it's, it started. And there's uh, lots of commercial software as well. How we're evolving this is, uh, which is a part of the interesting aspect of RISC-5 is we're evolving it based on volunteer help. So the companies can join at various uh, levels of participation and financial contribution. And then there's a bunch of volunteers that are filling in what's missing or evolving the design on things that are being done. And I think it was uh, a couple of thousand people are involved in all the various committees that are being going on. So it's, it's much like a standards effort. So as I'll say, there's some benefits of that. So what's our goal? And people, you know, when you started this open project, what was your goal? And as we thought about it, we we thought big, uh, become these industry standard instruction set for all computing devices. There's no technical reason why you couldn't have a 32-bit and 64-bit instruction set that would work everywhere. People people could do that. So wouldn't it be right? And kind of now, seven years after we're starting, if that was our goal. It's actually, you know, we can see evidence that's happening. It's uh, especially now, it really seems to be catching on more quickly. A lot of more domains, it's going faster. And it's at every level from the tiniest, uh, you know, uh, one penny processor up into a ludicrous uh, designs, uh, very aggressive designs, I think kind of ridiculously speculative and all that stuff. And the same instruction set is working everywhere. And then because we're trying to use it everywhere, people will say, hey, there's an instruction set that I really like, or for our marketplace, there's some fit missing features that you should have. And so as part of this model, we figured out, we've got kind of a scheme to allow instructions to be added for particular markets, but not force everyone to have to implement all the instructions in every single market. So this modularity is pretty key. And we're using the community. We're using, whoops, using the community to to develop the instruction set. So we've got this hardware and software experts involved before the instruction set is defined. So one of the uh, one of the uh, research firms has projected uh, how many core over time, how popular it's going to be. In you know, they're projecting 80 billion cores uh, by 2025. I think the kind of the more, maybe the more interesting thing is their first prediction that I did, I think two years ago was, was projecting 60 billion cores by 2025. And now they think it's 80. So that they, they think it's growing faster. Uh, how about participation in RISC-5 International? That's another indication of the interest. Uh, 2,300 members of various kinds across 70 countries, you know, uh, more than hundred chip companies, 45 software companies, um, there's a, more than 100 research labs and 2,000 individuals. As uh, Callista collected this data, it more than doubled in 2030, uh, in 2020 last year, and then the first half of 2021, it more than doubled again. So it's uh, a lot of enthusiasm around it. So I thought what I'd do is kind of looking at that slide, I'll do a worldwide, uh, uh, starting with North America, and I'll go from North America east around the world and talk about the popularity there. You, you can see some of the, the countries are colored are the ones where there's activity. So North America, uh, so the big companies here, Google, NVIDIA, Western Digital have embraced RISC-5. Uh, every Western Digital disk drive has RISC-5 cores and every NVIDIA GPU has it. So I would say hundreds of millions of RISC cores have been shipped in, based on products in North America. Europe, the home of ICK right now, uh, the European Union has a uh, processor initiative and RISC-V is a key architecture of high performance processing. Next, they'd like to have a processor architecture that's kind of European, I guess with ARM being bought first by the Japanese company and then by NVIDIA, it's not clear whether ARM's gonna remain European, but RISC-V can be European. And by the way, the headquarters of RISC-5 International Switzerland. So it's kind of the headquarters in Switzerland. So a lot of activity there, particularly in high performance computing. India was kind of the place that got us interested in uh, making it open. In 2014, they started asking us about RISC-5 
and uh, started building RISC V. Uh, we didn't know about them. They wanted to have, India wanted to have its own instruction set architecture so it could have independence. And it's, it's been declared as the national architecture of India is RISC V. And because of their early enthusiasm, we decided to help make that happen. Well, Pakistan's not gonna be outdone by India. And so here's shows pictures of a couple of RISC V uh, consortiums on the bank, a way of making RISC V a uh, Pakistani national instruction set. And I don't know if you can see, but there's even people in the balcony way in the back there. Uh, China, uh, RISC V is really picked up in China. Uh, Alibaba has itself, just Alibaba has shipped more than 1 billion RISC V cores so far. There's two associations in Chinese associations around RISC V in India that has you know, dozens of companies involved, uh, and Japan as well. Japan has got, uh, uh, you know, when we do workshops there, get huge attendance. So it really is a worldwide effort. And I'm, you know, in, in a time where there's tensions around the world, it's great to have something that we can collaborate all around the world. And, and make progress in just like we do in software that we can do this around hardware as well. Here's, uh, I don't think this is an up-to-date look of all the logos, but more or less just about every company that you can think of except ARM is, uh, is a member or will soon be a member of RISC-V. And then there's articles in the press about it too. You know, uh, it's certainly a good news story that, wow, uh, an academic, originally an academic project that's open is being embraced in hardware, just like it is it's been in software. What, what's the implications of all that for the industry? It leads to a lot of good stories. Well, given that I write the text, a lot, I'm a co-author of a lot of textbooks, <laughs> you know, maybe not surprisingly, there's risk five versions of these textbooks. Uh, you know, the, the computer heart, you know, what we call computer organization design, other people call it Patterson Hennessy. There's a risk five version, uh, the computer architecture approach with kind of MIPS kind of, you know, being future being unclear, we switched that over to risk five. And then uh, Andrew Waterman, who's the key graduate student, uh, along with Yun Sep Lee, and I wrote a, a very thin book to introduce risk five. It's, I think it's just about a hundred pages, which is a testimony to kind of the simplicity of RISC-V that you can write a hundred page book. But the other instruction sets, the proprietary instruction sets, uh, you know, a, a book would be a lot of pages, like thousands, I don't know how big it'd be. I, I think you can't even find books for some of the instruction sets because it's so hard. And, oh yeah, it's in lots of languages. Uh, particularly the RIS, this RISC-V Atlas, uh, RISC-V Reader, uh, it's, you know, it's for sale as a paperback book in English, but we've made free versions available in Spanish and Portuguese and uh, Chinese and Japanese, I think. Uh, and if you're interested in transplugging, let us know. We'll, we'll be happy to do it. So why is it so popular? You know, kind of especially people like us will concentrate on the technical details. Is it because you know, it's, it runs a benchmark faster or is low power. That's not the big reason. The big reason is this is a new business model for hardware that's really changing everything. If you're a startup company or even a big company and you're gonna get into this space, you're gonna do your own chip uh, and it's gonna have a processor in it. One of the first things you have to do is sign a contract with who's gonna supply the processor. The benefit of RISC-V is given all of the possible suppliers there, you can pick RISC-V and you don't have to sign any contracts and then you can later figure out uh, who's your vendor gonna be, or are you gonna build it yourself? So this is a advantage for all companies, but particularly for startups. They don't have to wait six months to negotiate a contract right? and contracts can take a long time, I'm sure. Uh, secondly, uh, in, as Moore's law is diminishing, a lot of us believe accelerators are going to be the future. A lot of gains are going to have in price performance. Uh, you can add your own extensions without having to get permission from the owner of the instruction set. That's built in, and I'll talk about that some. And then if there's things missing right now, uh, features or issues of term, you don't, you're not interested in the power performance area where it is, you're looking for other things, it's probably going to develop. Uh, probably uh, things are getting fixed because of the kind of groundswell of enthusiasm and all the companies involved. And, you know, the, the older instruction sets are more established and have a richer ecosystem, but it's rapidly catching up. 
So now I'm going to dive into kind of the, the, the technical details here of what's going on. And here's the high level view, the, the really distinguished features. It really is simple. I'll, I'll give you an example, but far simpler than the commercial instruction sets. What I didn't quite appreciate before is a lot like, why do they make them so complicated? There's kind of a marketing reason. There's some technical justification, but a large marketing reason for the making instruction sets more complicated. Uh, it can make it harder for other people to copy them. That's one. But also if you're selling instruction sets, you can raise the fees or ask people to buy a new model once you change the instruction set. When you go to one version to the next version, you can charge more money. So there's actually a financial incentive to expanding the instruction set, even if there's not a good technical justification. It's a clean slate design. Uh, there's no dependencies on, you're not trying to be compatible with something in the past, it, you're starting over. So this avoids, you know, it makes sure that the privilege instructions, user instructions are completely distinct. So you can do virtual machines and uh, easy to do operating systems. And it learned from the mistakes of the risk architectures. It doesn't have some of the things that are tied to technology or tied to microarchitecture, like in the early risk days at MIPS, MIPS and uh, the Berkeley risk one and two had delayed branches, which were great for five stage pipelining, not so great thereafter. So it avoids all that stuff, learning from our mistakes. One of the important um, and co cool features is it's modular. And as you'll see, is there's a base instruction that all software runs on and everything else is optional. That's a new idea in the past for instruction set architectures. It was, uh, it was inclusive is once you added instruction, it was there forever and everybody who has to implement it. So instruction sets were like most human bodies when you know, narrow waste when you're young, as you get older, the waste gets bigger. And that's kind of what happened instruction sets. That's not the case of risk five. Risk five has optional options that you can implement for particular applications. Uh, and then, you know, we included, uh, we know code size is important for a bunch of applications, but kind of it helps at the low end, it can affect your cost, the size of your program memory at the high end, it can affect cash hit rates. So we made sure we had variable length instructions. Uh, so we could get a code compression, and it also means we, you know, we'll never run out of opcode code space. I talked about instruction sets coming and going or being sold to competitors. Uh, it, RISC V is stable. This, the base and the first extensions are frozen. They're not going to change uh, over time. And this modularity means new instruction set things are optional. You don't have to include them. And then finally, community design. And there's you know, examples, I'll talk about the vector instructions example, but there's what's really, typically what you do if you're a computer architect at a company, you try and come up with a, a useful extension, you talk to the people inside the company, you try and talk to some customers to get their input, and then you announce it. And then all the software people complain. <laughs> oh, you screwed that up. What about this and this and this? So what's you know, nice about RISC V, because everything's open, the instruction set development is open as well. So we get the software experts and the hardware experts to get feedback as we're going along. And what we try to do is not finalize the standard until we have software that uh, you know, compilers and operating systems that use it and have implementations possibly in FPGAs. So we've got some experience before we finalize it. So it's, we, we have more time, it takes more time, but we have more time to get it right. And given that instruction sets last 50 years, pretty nice that we can get it right the first time because we're going to be living with it for a long time. Okay, so that's distinguishing features. Let's, you know, sure, you claim it's simple. <laughs> uh, well, it's got this small base and it can run the full C compiler all software stack. So it's not like it traps uh, if you execute the other instructions, you, you can just have it run only on the base and that, that works fine. Uh, it, what are the benefits of this? It makes it easy to add instructions. You've got the, the base that you need, and then you can only add the special instructions you need for the application. It's you can really quickly learn the instruction set uh, in more either for very low cost implementations, or if you're in some new exotic technology, it's got a very low gate count, so that's going to be very attractive for people. It also reduces verification costs, and you know that has a lot to do with how long it takes to do something. Uh, and uh, it's easy to build. Uh, so it's, it's a great way to get started. And if you're doing things like fault tolerance, for example, like for space applications, you want to start off with a real simple uh, low gate count thing and, and make it uh, more tolerant. 
this is the base instruction set. So these 42 instructions, and you can see the instruction formats, that's it. Uh, for me, from the historical perspective, it's called RISC-5. I went back and looked at RISC-1, and this is pretty much the very similar to the RISC-1 instruction set about the same operations and the same number of operations. The instruction formats are different, but the operations are very similar. So I found that pleasing. So the modularity right off the bat it was modular. Multiply divine aren't even aren't even part of the standard. Those are optional. So there's actually four bases now to address the marketplace. There's an embedded version, a regular integer version, 32 bit, 64 bit, and we even did 128 bit. Now that's we don't need 128 bit yet. It's it's not necessary. But what we learned from computer history is the one mistake that kills an architecture is not having enough address bits. So if this thing's in the last 50 years. There's going to be people who want to go a bigger than a 64-bit address space instruction set, so that's already been factored in. So uh, the only <laughs> if we if we I think it'll take a while to use more than 128 uh, uh, bits, so that'll be a problem sometime in, uh, in the next century, maybe, but not for this century. Um, uh, th there's these six standard extensions, uh, multiply and divide are even optional, atomic, single and double search and floating point. And we thought caught something with all of those, uh, uh, the G standard kind of general purpose. We've defined quad precision. I don't think hardware is really being built yet with quad precision, but again, probably this century, somebody's gonna wanna do that. So that's what I'm done. Uh, and this is using a 32-bit word, but we have a, a, a C com com compressed instruction though offers 16-bit instructions so we can get the code compression. And this is, you know, in our view, this is frozen and it's going to, we've officially ratified by the RISC-V Foundation and it's going to live forever. Uh, yeah, so uh, we've already said these things, and stabilities, new features via extensions, and there's no commercial incentive to force manually up rates. If you're, if you have a proprietary instruction set and you're enhancing it all the time, you want to force everybody who's using your instruction set to migrate to the next one so the software stack works with the latest instruction set. That's not the that's not required for risk five because the software works from the base and you only use optionally the instructions there. It's a foundation owns it. Uh, where the foundation isn't going to sell it, sell the instruction set to another foundation, and the foundation is not going away, just like the Linux Foundation. Uh, so is not that RFC. Uh, you know, our view is this, you know, is an instruction set, once it achieves liftoff, can live a very long time, like the IBM 360 is approaching 60 years now. Uh, so I think is uh, the software tools for the base and all this is going to be around for decades. The extensibility is because, you know, the Berkeley Foundation, we were interested in getting into these application specific processors. And so we plan for that. So basically, uh, what you don't need permission to do that and it's very popular in uh, in uh, accelerator project for machine learning and artificial intelligence i was having uh lunch yesterday with members of the risk five board of directors and uh, one person said of all the startup there's a lot of startups and a lot of companies doing ml accelerators he said all of them are using risk five he hasn't seen anybody not use risk five for the accelerators because you know you can easily enhance it and, and by the way, if a risk five, it's, that's a nice place to be. If all startups are using your instruction set, uh, some of those startups are going to make it. That's kind of bodes well for the future if they're all using risk five. So let's just talk about how, how are we doing this enhancement for those interested in nitty gritty. So, uh, what we call standard is divided by risk five, uh, the opcodes that are reserved is reserved for risk five international for future use. And then there's a custom space that risk five international is not going to use. And so you can use to add your custom instructions. So just show that visually here, are the, here are the first four extensions using up in that reserve space, and you can use custom instructions so they won't step on each other in terms of binary compatibility. And you, and how do you use those instructions? You, you know, create your own software libraries and, and call them. So let's talk about the vector instruction set. Uh, uh, Krista and I had done vector architecture projects. In fact, that was his dissertation at Berkeley. So actually pretty excited about doing the vector instruction set. So the vector instruction set 
was done with a lot of people with all kinds of interests as we'll talk about both hardware and software. So it's a pretty interesting design. So kind of a classically, it has 32 vector registers. That's not such a big surprise. Uh, you specify the length of the vector registers is uh, uh, implementation is specific. There's no, there's no fixed vector length size. Uh, implementations can pick their own. I'll give you examples of that. That's one of the big advantages versus SIMD. SIMD wires the width of the basically the SIMD registers into the opcode. So every time you double the vector registers, you need new opcodes and you have to recompile. So that's a real negative. A novel feature of RIS-5 is uh, the, we don't have opcodes for every single width. That's encoded in, in a register. So you can say I'm, these, it, these operands are 16-bit or these operands are 64-bit and you, you don't use up opcode space. Uh, and then it's got some elegant ways to get rid of the bookkeeping overhead uh, that's typically for vectorized loops. If it's not a multiple of the width, it, it's, uh, we've got instructions that support that automatically handles those cases. Okay, so like I said, it had all kinds of uses uh, here, trying to use a vector architecture from the simplest to the most exotic. So the first column there is the issue policy. Is it in order or out of order? So it was, it had input from people who want to do in order as well as out of order, people who only wanted to do one instruction at a time to people who wanted to do six instructions per issue. Uh, the actual length of the vector registers, uh, there are people who wanted to do an embedded vector for embedded devices, so like only 32 bits long up until uh, people who wanted to have really giant vector registers for high performance computing, that's 16 K bits long. The actual data path widths vary from just 32 bits at a time at the low end to 2K bits per clock cycle, basically at the high end. And how many uh, how many times does it take to go over the data path width to, to achieve those lengths? So it, a, a wide set of targets, and so it took a while for them all to agree on what the instruction sets would be. So now, uh, what I, I thought we'd do is uh, Andrew and I are working on the next edition of our book. I, it's going to take us a while to do there, but one of the first things we wanted to do was describe the vector architecture. So in our in that book, the RIS-5 Atlas, we use the Daxby loop uh, was in there to kind of illustrate what's going on uh, to give you an example of the registers so uh, of the different instruction sets. So I put together based on the book this: uh, How does Daxby work on SIMD? ARM has a vector instruction set for ARM64 for that versus RISC-5. And it's, you know, I found it kind of eye-opening. So first, the first thing right up front is because vector length is not wired into the opcodes, uh, as you change the vector length, I, we look at different sizes of vectors in the example, but the, the vector code for ARM and RISC-5, you don't have to recompile. It, you can change the vector length and the hardware and the binary stays the same. For SIMD, you have to recompile. I show you two different sizes, the AVX, uh, the Intel AVX2, which is 128-bit, and the AVX512, which is 512-bit. So the, you have to recompile those designs. And then when you look at the code itself, it's a, you know it's about 10-ish instructions for this simple DAX speed loop for the vector architectures. It's about twice that. Why is it twice that? Well, because of the bookkeeping overhead. What happens if, it, if the number of elements is not a multiple of the width, then you have to have a, extra instructions in there. So most of the code is in SIMD is for handling that case. There's a few instructions to do the extra computation. So that's like why there's about a factor of two difference, factor of two more instructions for SIMD than vector. For the code size itself, it's uh, risk five is even more efficient. Why is that? Well, it's besides the instructions, for re, you know, we have compact instructions, 16-bit instructions, and ARM chose not to do that. They're all instructions of 32-bit, so the programs are smaller. And then we start talking about the instructions being executed, uh, and we can see there's big benefits there as well. Kind of, it's kind of a, a nerdy thing, but what happens is uh, we uh, we set the state to be the register, number of register bits of registers to be the same in the two comparison, one to the 128-bit one and one to the 2048-bit one. And there's big factors there. Why is it so many more instructions? And it's because ARM, you only use two of the 32 vectors uh, and uh, in AVX, you use two of the eight vectors. And for the 512, you use 216. RISC-V has this idea where you can, if you don't need to all the registers, you can make them longer. So it works there. 
Okay, I think I need to speed up a little bit. I'm, I'm uh, loquacious this morning. Uh, let me talk about fragmentation versus diversity. People worry about fragmentation. Well, that's like, it's crazy that the world has some left wheel drive cars, some right. We should have picked one and stuck with it, but there was no standardization. But diversity is useful. You'd want, both of those vehicles have wheels, but you know they're specialized for good reason. So diversity is important. How we're avoiding fragmentation is you know users, no one wants to get locked in and soft, no one can do software by themselves. We have to for, have software. And if you wanna keep the software up to date, you have to uh, upstream the open source. So software is forcing fragmentation to happen. Risk five and security. Uh, it has, uh, it's popular because it's open in that group. It has already has a formal spec and there's no limits who can work on it. Uh, I, one of the exciting things is that DARPA decided to do a competition where we compare a lot of different security schemes, enclaves, capabilities, security monitors, and this idea from Morpheus, which is out of Todd Austin University. Um, Austin, what he does is always uh, encrypt the pointers and then churn, we're re-encrypting them frequently. And what happened with this effort, uh, they put all four approaches, they offered $50,000 to break in, uh, they ran a little medical uh, attack and they got 50,000 broken in, there were hundreds of people attacking. Morpheus was, oh, nobody broke into Morpheus. So the, what an encouraging sign that there's actually, our hardware innovation that hackers couldn't break, you know, and that's the most uplifting story I've heard in this area. I think in the interest of time, I'm going to skip the video and so that we can go for questions. Uh, but if you go to risk5.org, you can, uh, you can see these 10th anniversary of videos and it captures some of the enthusiasm. I think it, it's almost like a religious fervor. People really like the idea of things being open. Their programmers are only work for companies who do things open source. There's something about that that uh, is attractive uh, to engineers. And, um, and so now we've brought that into the hardware domain. I think with that, I'll stop and open up for questions. Yeah, thank you a lot for the, the very uh, interesting insight and, and bringing up very interesting uh, points here and excellent talks. Thanks a lot, Dave. Uh, yeah, we already have uh, one question uh, in in the chat, and uh, please also post further if you like. Uh, of course, you you report that there are many things that are already covered by research groups, by uh, industry, and there's one maybe uh, very interesting, but also very natural follow up question: Which areas in the Risk Five development hardware or software mostly? need the risk 5 community to work on and improve so where uh, are the where, where should people work on now where do you see the the main challenges in this domain uh of, yeah first of all uh you know uh if you're interested in helping uh, mark hemelstein is our, our chief technical officer and he can tell me what you tell there's a lot of things that we can work on i'd say uh one thing that's really important you know the the GCC tools are in pretty great shape. LLVM is a little bit behind. And uh, I, I, depending who I talk to, it's got a ways to go or it's it's catching up. So certainly the LLVM software stack. Uh, we need something that we call platforms. So depending if your platform is a, a Linux platform or you're doing something for some embedded device, we want to try and do the specifications of what a platform is, which will mean what what's a stable target for software to, to go after. And so define some of those platforms. There's work being done in, uh, in that area. Uh, there's some, uh, there's a security committee that's pretty active. Uh, they're gonna start doing best practices and maybe talk about things to, that reduce the chances of uh, successful attacks, maybe even propose instructions, successful attacks for, for uh, the instruction leaking um, so those, those are some of the areas there. Uh, uh, there's, we need to get formal specs. If you like formal specifications, you know, uh, every time we do an extension, we need to have a formal specification of a piece of it. There's plenty of opportunities for, for, for uh, doing that part of it. But yeah, there's, it's kind of a community effort. So it's got this exciting potential, but uh, for, to achieve its potential, 
it depends on volunteers to help uh, make it happen. So, and the good news is uh, the last five years we made a lot of progress, but there's still plenty of stuff for the people to help with. Okay, now uh, uh, further questions come up. Uh, if different users use different extended uh, risk five ISAs, how do you deal with a scenario of fragmented ISAs? Yeah, that's why I did the fragmentation slide. Yeah, we've had this, this, this question we've had continuously since 2014. <laughs> so, um, you know, a whole, I think what we're used to is binary compatibility. I think, I think that's where we're kind of conditioned on kind of the IBM PCs and people shipping stuff in binary. A lot, a lot of stuff is not shipped in binary, right? It, the, the problem would be is if it's binaries and a lot of things are not shipped in binary these days. Uh, you know, uh, Google's in the cloud. Most of that is not binary. Um, the edge, uh, a lot of it's not binary. You know, PCs have binary compatibility. The application processors have binary compatibility. But as we said, you know, it's we don't nobody wants to get uh, locked in. So the, you, you, it's going to be using custom instructions when uh, it makes sense. For application processors, like if you're going to do phones, it's it's going to be a difficulty if there's custom instructions in some phones and, and others, and you want to make those available in the binaries. Uh, I think what's going to go happen, custom instructions will be limited to software libraries on specific applications that can get away with it. But I think the, kind of the high-level thing is binary compatibility isn't as important in the modern world as it was in the past, which would have made fragmentation more concerning and it's and it's a reason why proprietary instruction sets won't let you do custom instructions because of binary compatibility used to be overwhelmingly important there's another question how does the risk five affect the uh, accelerator design yeah the way i think of accelerators you know i've had some experience in that is um uh, this application like machine learning that almost all the computation you're accelerating, but it's not 100%. There's other things you have to do. You have to talk to networks, there's user interfaces, there's you know, operating systems, there's all kinds of stuff. So I think of you know, uh, the value of a accelerator heavy thing is primarily in the accelerator, but you still need a general purpose instruction set. So it kind of flips the importance of the general purpose instruction set is you, know, you need one, you'd like to have a nice one, but it's not, it's not where all the computation is happening. You're, you're, it's, you can't do an accelerator without a general purpose processor, but the values in the accelerator. So then why spend a lot of money on the general purpose instruction set? Or the, uh, you may not need a very sophisticated processor in the general purpose instruction set if all the work's being done by the accelerator. So that that's, I think, kind of this, our accelerator rich, our future or present kind of is another argument for an open architecture for the general purpose stuff. And in your talk, you, you said that with 128 bit, you're on the safe side for this century. Yeah, so, I think so. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, it's uh, good, good to, <laughs> to know. Yeah, but well, uh, I, I, in the past, we used about, I think what DRAMs are not growing as fast, but in the past, we used to use up about one bit a year or something like that. So <laughs> if we're 64 bits, but, but, okay. but, but sometimes in, in application like cryptography or so, you also have a uh, larger scalability, but that's something you would then handle over the vector processing. Yeah, the, uh, in terms of encryption and stuff like that, there's uh, the, uh, the security people are doing the encryption are enthusiastic about the vector architecture, but there's also, uh, there's a significant uh, encryption standard that's being developed right now that pe people are working on that. And, and you know, we know how to, I don't, we're not going to look at 200, we're not going to worry about 256-bit RISC-V, but if you've got it working for 32, 64, 128, I'm pretty sure we can figure out how to do 256 if it really comes to it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, this... Uh... So we were able to, to answer the all, all the questions. So uh, Dave, thanks oh. thanks a lot once more that you have been available. It was a great presentation. You gave a lot of uh, insight here into the whole process. So thanks a lot for uh, being here at ICCAT. And so, uh, I mean, normally I would wish you a good trip home. You're, you're, it looks like yeah. you're already at home. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so, it, I, I, I'm going to have 
I'm going to have breakfast. So like at okay, <laughs> okay. So, so, so you you deserve this, yeah. So you already yeah. worked before breakfast, and so yeah. yeah. Uh, so we we give you a, a big uh, round of applause, yeah, in the virtual way, and and thanks a lot for uh, being with us today, and uh, for all the other participants. I now uh, uh, let you go to the next technical session, and this ends this keynote session. Thanks a lot, everybody.